Hi, everyone. It's like he read our, we gave hey. him our thing. I know. That was a really good setup. That was amazing. Okay. Hi, I'm Gigi, and I am an electric and classical guitarist. I'm also an associate professor at Indiana University, Jacob School of Music. And to quote one of my favorite guitarists in the world, Mark Stewart, I play somewhat popular music and a little unpopular music and very, very unpopular music. So that's kind of what I do. And I'll hand it over to my colleague, Cami. All right, I'm Cami Rowan, and I teach at Guilford College, a small little liberal arts school in Greensboro, North Carolina. You probably know me if you know me from the Eastern Music Festival, which I'm the director of, and uh, Jason's my colleague, and we have different artists, guest artists, and Gigi was there last year. And when we met, we had like a synergy where caps. <laughs> Capricorns. Yes, and uh, so we, we uh, I have a lot of gratitude, I want to say, for being here, for the GFA inviting us to do this, for, to be able to do it with Gigi, and for you to be here. So uh, also, you might know me from the U.S. Guitar Orchestra. Um, I'm the creator of that little project, which we'll talk about today. Great. So I guess, you know, we want to actually get you to think about and walk out and with a lot of thinking and with a lot of ideas. And we want you to kind of start turning your wheels about like your creative projects and what you could be doing. And I want you to walk out with more questions than actual answers. So um, if you're confused, we did a really great job. That's right, Well, Actually, if you don't walk out of here with your wheels spinning about who you are, because most of you are either a parent, teacher, or, or, or player. And we want just to turn your head on about how can you do this thing? How can you be a musician and be fulfilled as a human, like fiscally, uh, spiritually, emotionally? I mean, all this you're gonna have to ultimately figure out for yourself, but our idea is to motivate you to think at a deeper level about it and just to offer options. So our first question to you is, we've broken our talk down into hats, right? Um, what kind of hats do you guys think of for yourselves that you have to wear in order to be a successful musician in the 21st century. So examples as in like social media hat, manager hat, being your own mom hat. So think about these hats and if you have some ideas, raise your hand. Please don't be shy. It's 10 a.m. I know, I know, I know. Please. What are some hats? What are some hats? What are some of the cool creative hats? Don't be shy. What do you have to do? What do you have to wear? What hat do you have to wear to be successful? Mini. Teacher hat. Teacher yes. Hat. Yeah. Great. Come on, more, more. Curator. Curator hat. Yeah. That was beautiful. Great. Mentor. Mentor hat. Beautiful. Yes, yeah. Good. Business person hat. Yes. Business person. Yes. Level head. Collaborative. Yeah. Yep. Social media marketer. Yes. Uh, yes. Got to do it. Whether you want to or not. Yes. Did anyone take a former? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Great. We're missing that. Yep. Maybe not quite at the performer level, but how about evangelists? Oh, uh, for the guitar, yeah. guitar evangelist. We, we don't get much classical where I come from, and it's, it's really nice to, to play out. Yep, that makes sense. To introduce people to. Great. We're always educating people about things. Great. Okay, good, that. good. Okay. Let's go to slide two. So I do like, I love cats. Um, so we, we're broken up to, to four big structures. So we're gonna do the big hats first, okay? So within the artist hat, there's multiple hats, you know, the composer and arranger and everything. But we're gonna go through four big slides and we're gonna walk you through these um, hats and we're gonna explore these different types of hats, okay? So we're gonna move on to the next hat, okay? Um, Take a look at these. Just let your eyes kind of go through them for a second and see where you find yourself. Because you gotta, you gotta think about your strengths, this whole, the whole talk, you gotta think about who are you, how do you fit in this, what, where do you see yourself? Good. While you're taking a look, I wanted to kind of talk to you about um, my, you know, my path to finding my own voice. And I think being an artist is actually about your identity. 
in finding your own voice. And I want to kind of tell you um, how I found my voice. And it, it has been, it has never been a very smooth sailing path. It's been very up and down and left and right and very turbulent. So I grew up um, listening to all kinds of music. I started playing guitar because I wanted to be in a band, okay? I grew up listening to Richie Blackmore from Deep Purple. I was very inspired by Jimmy. I wanted to be like Jimmy. I wanted to be like Prince and PJ Harvey. They were my idols. And my parents took me to a musical shop. And I was like, give me a Gibson or a Fender. Yes. And they never did. They said classical guitar was on sale. And if I did this for very good and practiced it for a year, they'll buy me an electric. That never happened. I bought my own many years later. And so I always knew that I had this kind of this, you know, appreciation for uh, not just classical, but I, I still fell in love with classical music. And I was trained rigorously as um, as a very conservatory, very traditional competition player. So I skipped out of high school and I went to college when I was 14 in Korea, which was very intense. Um, did not know how traumatic that was. <laughs> and, and I actually followed Jason, um, who came to Korea to give a master class and a recital. And I followed him to the US. And, but there were still moments of, you know, I didn't really know who I was. I was doing all this rep because I felt like I had to for the competitions and for the classical guitar recitals. And something changed in me in 2014, which was I attended this beautiful summer festival called Ban and Can Summer Festival, which is amazing. And it's basically this contemporary classical music um, festival. You go and you hang out for two weeks and this beautiful museum, Mocha, um, Museum in Massachusetts, and you play all kinds of music. So in the morning, we'll, you know, practice Andreasen, which you heard last night, and at lunch, you play your classical set. At night, we're all jamming out to folk Americana music. And that's when I realized music is music. I felt like I always had to put, categorize all this music and compartmentalize my passions. And I realized you don't have to do that. And I started to incorporate all these different types of music in my recitals. And wow, I did not have a thunder and wipe me out and I, I didn't get punished. I didn't die. I, I thought I was really gonna burst into flames and die. And um, like a repertoire police, like, you can't do that. And I realized, no, nothing happened. Nothing actually happened. And so, I really want to make sure that, you know, that I jump is really scary, but I'm going to kind of show you some of my creative um, samples that I've done um, the past few years and show you what I've been up to. And I think that might kind of inspire you and they're really, really sometimes weird. So let's do that. Um, okay, so... Uh, the first thing that you're going to listen to is a little excerpt of a commissioning project called Unbound, where I commissioned eight composers to each write a um, solo guitar work that is virtuosic. Because I was coming out of the pandemic, and I was really depressed, and I wanted to start playing music again, and I wanted to get better at my chops. So it was really interesting, and everyone had very different ideas of what virtuosity meant. So we're going to hear um, the first example of an uh, Icelandic composer, um, Gleib Jörnsson. I do this thing where I 
press space and then it jumps. Um, so, and the next, next um, piece that you're going to hear is a collaborative um, piece that I, you know, worked with this composer, Hilary Purrington, and a record composer's orchestra um, um, premiered this piece together. And she had this really cool idea about this concerto. She wanted to kind of um, take the guitar as not much just as like a soloist, but the mothership, like I control the orchestra, and that was a really cool um, project. So I also, because she said mothership, so I wanted to look like an alien, like 2000, like, you know, space sci-fi things. So, um, you know, I was really into, I mean, as I really love wearing weird clothes on stage. So you can, um, and I also put fake nails that were like, you know, shiny, it was holographic, it was so fun. So always change my hair every year. That's key in your success. Also, I arrange a lot of music, and that's kind of, you know, where my brain is, and I also love chamber music. It's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a duo with cellist John Henry Crawford, who's amazing, and also um, violinist. I'm also in a band, which you'll hear in a bit, and I thought this worked so well with cello. Um, you guys all know this piece, it's Low Rowers. Um, You'll, you'll, you'll know, and it's a, it was a very fun arrangement project. And this was like a really cool commission um, project from Austin Guitar Society. They asked about um, to write something about home, right? And I left Korea when I was 15, and I don't know where my home is. I lived in Cleveland, I lived in Philly, I lived in New York, I lived in Arizona, and I'm going to live in Indiana. That word is really hard for me. Home. What is home? So I wrote this play, I wrote this piece called Where You Are Now is Exactly Where You're Supposed to Be. And I'm so emo, it's, it's incredible. I, I, I'm, I'm emo, okay. So the thing was that it's not really a place. Home is not a place. But it's about the memories that you create with the people around you, right? It's about that summer dewy night, you get into trouble with your friends by drinking a little too much. And, well, if you're underage, you don't know that. I just forget I said that. Or the food that you, your parents made for you. Or, you know, when you fell in love with somebody at a party, house party, right? It's that feeling. So I wrote this piece. It's for um, four guitars, four classical guitar and electric guitar. It's basically just really fun um, rock up music.
really fast. So now um, I improvise a lot because um, that's really good for my soul. And I hope you improvise as well. You can do 20 minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes every day. It's good for you. It's like eating veggies. So I, this is a recent project that I did with Darren Donovan Thomas. He's an amazing, amazing violinist. If you guys know Moses, um, he tours with Moses and he, he tours with literally everyone famous. Um, and I had this really great opportunity. We literally met the day before our show. We're like, how do we put an hour show together? Literally, that's that what happens. And I'm like, let's go with it. Let's like try Ableton and creating more sound. So this is it. Last arrangement, um, I did this Jules Eastman project and um, my band, Wild Up, um, we, we just released this album, which is crazy, and this ridiculous album just got nominated for the Grammys this year. It was like crazy, it was ridiculous. And this arrangement was like, okay, I have this, I have two versions of this, it's called Heavy and Light. I want it to be inspired by doom metal, so um, if you guys don't know what doom metal is, you're you're really a sad person. So um, and so I was using like Fibertonics and I wanted to make this as heavy as possible. It's kind of a you know reimagined Julian is Eastman music. So you're in for a treat. <laughs> It's available in the archives of Julius Eastman, and um, you know our team did a really cool job, like you know, you know, doing the the album design and everything. So we found a really cool old photos of Julius. It's a great fit for that piece. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, really quickly, two more projects, and I'm done. I'm talking too much. So this is my interdisciplinary work. I collaborate a lot, and this is my VR project that I did with some of the friends. And it's basically, you know, we put people with VR headsets and we would push them around and it was like live music and we wanted to take them into um, space, kind of um, like interstellar style. <laughs> It's way cooler when you have the VR set, you just feel like... During COVID, we wanted to do an immersive um, audience kind of interactive piece because we're so, I was kind of over the whole live stream concert. I was so depressed, like I said. So um, so my friends and I, we, we developed this program, this thing where 
people can go on YouTube chat and it's like, you know, the, 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 it's being streamed and, and you can ask like a question. So it's like an eight ball thing where the campfire and you ask a question and we answer them. And every time you, we answer them, um, the scenes will change and the music will change. So that was a really interesting process because it was a lot of work. It was a lot of um, technology stuff. And so I had to wrote, write like 60 minutes of music, which are all different scenes, like one minute like loop that is all different. So it was really interesting um, process to make short bits of music, but I had such a really fun time. So, so this would also be VR if you wanted to, or you can also interact in like a 360 way with a tablet or anything. So this, um, this was really funny. Somebody asked um, in the chat, it's like, what did what did um, Mozart say to Beethoven? And it's like, um, play something, but not that. So that's a thing we're just, we, we um, quoted that is really fun. So those are my classical guitar sound that's been very processed. I use this um, software called Ableton. So I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I just want to kind of go, go through what you just saw, right? Because how does this relate to you? You just saw chamber music. You saw collaborations with orchestras, with bands, with uh, other instrumentalists. You saw video, video projects and uh, um, digital projects. You saw interactive, interdisciplinary. You saw a lot in that, right? So hopefully you're seeing yourself in some of this. It's, it's com comes back to you guys. For me, um, I grew up in a pretty rural place in West Virginia. And I grew up kind of singing and strumming and that kind of thing, just like all of you guys. But by the, I, I knew I wanted to teach by the time I was 17. That's when I started teaching. I just, I'm an extrovert. I learn from people and I love that, that cycle of like, what I learned from students and what they learned from me and just that's kind of a beautiful thing in my life. So I knew that's what I wanted to do and I also knew I was a collaborator. And you know, again, your identity will shape your path, right? What do you believe in? What's your, what are your passions? What do you care about? How do you lead and live your life out loud and how does that relate to the kind of artist you are, right? Um, for me, I believe that music creates community and connection between people. So most of my projects are related to connecting people, building community through the love of music. That's kind of my jam. And I kind of sit around and think, what hasn't been done before? That's like a big question in my mind. What has somebody not done that I could do well? And a lot of what I've done comes out of that question, just literally, what could I do? Hmm. So, um, so the first thing I will talk about, I think, oh, also I just want to say I'm older than Gigi. So for me also as a female, um, I had a little bit of a different tra trajectory, although you still could probably talk about being a female in the guitar world pretty easily. Yeah. Um, so, and, and we're, you know, I'm a lot older than her. So um, we may have had to work a little harder. I remember my first GFA, which I will not tell you the year because you will, you will be like, oh my God. Um, I was probably one of five, five females at the, at the convention. So, um, all right. So the U S guitar orchestra, the way it came about was I love to travel. I travel the world. I'm lucky to be able to do that. And, um, I thought, I wonder if guitarists want to travel a, because it would give me opportunity to travel even more and B, I could kind of help show people the, the world and, and do things with, you know, music that way. So in 2017, I had a sabbatical, my first and only so far, and I decided to try to take a bunch of guitars to Iceland. So, I know where Gigi will be in a few weeks. Get married. Get Getting married to an Iceland. <laughs> Yay, Gigi! It's a big commitment. And uh, so what I did was I got a tour company, just called them up, okay, how much is this? And when, you know, I shopped around a little bit, landed on a tour company, and within 30 days, just in the region where I live, I had 28 guitarists signed up, plus a bunch of parents. I mean, it took me 30 days. All I did was be like, hey, I'm going to Iceland, anyone wanna go? 
There were three of us. We did three big pieces, and Alan Hirsch and I and Mark Charles Smith each conducted different pieces, and we went to Iceland, and it was a blast. Played in Harper Hall. It was awesome. I know. So then I decided, hmm, there are, you, there are American choruses, American orchestras, American bands. Like, even my brother was in, like, an all-American chorus, but I've never heard of a U.S. or all-American guitar thing. So I just said, okay, let's do it. And my first iteration of that was in 2019. We launched in Carnegie Hall, and then we toured France. And I, Bill Kanegaiser was my soloist. I commissioned a piece from Brian Head, Brian Johansson, and Kevin Callahan. I got 42 players from 23 different states and seven different countries, including some big players like Stephen Mattingly, Sylvie was there, um, a, a few you know doctors and, and good players, and we were, it was good. And then I decided I'd do it every other year. So then I did my second one uh, in Spain, and we launched in Merkin Hall uh, in New York City. So we, I decided 42, with, that was too many. I couldn't really keep, I wanted this to be the best guitar orchestra in the US, and I couldn't do it with 42 different, it's too, too many strings. So we cut down to 32, or maybe 31, and it was a, it was a more cohesive group. And I did a, another Kevin Callahan uh, commission and an Alan Hirsch commission, and then we played a piece by Mark Charles Smith. All right, so just real quickly, I will show you, you can just go to this yourself, but this is the website, it's guitar or, usguitarorchestra.org, and I just want to say right here, this is a picture of us in Spain. Javier Yara was my uh, soloist in Spain last summer. You might see some faces you know, hopefully. There are someone in the room, I can't remember who, that did this with me. And JP, you might know JP. All right, artistic excellence, because I do want it to be the best ensemble in the U.S., Creating and building community. I just said that because it's because my projects are connected. The people who come to the Eastern Music Festival are in the orchestra, and you know I feel like there's a you know we are we're a small community. You know that um, we're going to stick together. Global perspectives, which is big time my jam, and beyond tradition for me is about I want music beyond tradition. So um, I've got some exciting people writing coming up. So I'm going to see if I can do this ad free and just play a little bit of this. Where am I? 324. This is not an exciting call. Cats really know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> At least it's cats, okay? At least it's not something really awkward. It could have been so awkward. So this is Myth of Persephone. This is a video that just came out. This is a Callahan piece. Jamming on the contra. So we did this last October. These are nine players from the orchestra that I was able to get to come to Greensboro and get in the recording studio. And Okay, so I would love to show you more, but I can't. That's a great po pose right there, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm excited about expanding this now because my brain is just going. So I'm thinking about like setting up some ensemble festivals in other countries. Um, and doing a lot of kind of one-off projects and commissions, and so now that it's expanding for me. All right, uh, the Eastern Music Festival is just uh, kind of was a dream for me for a lot of years uh, to create a guitar program, and I don't know, we're in our seventh or eighth year, we skipped a year uh, during COVID. And, and who do you have this year? For the we guests? have, I was gonna say, so stepping out of tradition and beyond tradition, we've got Baji joining us, so it'll be Jason and I, and, oh, uh, and, and Frederick, Frederick. Yeah, and it's going. So last year, Gigi was our guest artist. We've had uh, Thomas uh, Vilto, and we had Julian Gray for many, many years, but he retired from us. This is, uh, the Eastern Music Festival is every summer for two weeks. It's a very immersive, like, it's all day, every day. And there are no weekends, you know? You're just like nine to like nine guitar. 
and we do chamber music, and uh, you're playing with what? Uh, a hobo. Hobo? Yeah. Yep. So, so the, the better players get chamber assignments with other instruments, and we do orchestra, and we do all kinds of stuff. And with Baji this year, we're going to be doing circle singing and improvisation and body percussion and all kinds of cool stuff. Where? where? It's in Greensboro, North Carolina at Guilford College. School. Yeah. Is that my school? All right. And it's an orchestral festival. All right, quickly, uh, and, and once, you know, I love the natural world, that's why I travel, to see animals in the natural world. So I was part of a creator for an Aaron, I'm not on the board of Aaron Shear anymore, but we did a Zion workshop for like five years now, it's in the, um, the mountains of North Carolina, and Andrew York will be a guest artist there this, this August. But as you can see, we would hike in the mornings, and then we would do guitar in the afternoons. So that was like, again, Hopefully what you're seeing is these are all born out of our passions. Like, what, what are we good at? You know, I'm, I'm really good at travel. Uh, so that's something that I can apply, a skill that I can apply. Um, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, so how do you see your identities through our project work? And how does that speak to you and your identity? That's the question that we want you to ask. Yeah. Yeah, let's go on. Let's go on. Okay, so teaching is a really big part of, I think, as an artist. I think, you know, we learn a lot from our mentors and through school and from the teaching, and it's, it's huge. And I just, you know, for me to get a teaching job, um, I was extremely lucky, and I actually never thought I would, you know, I had this kind of insecurity, actually, um, when I was like 23, 24, just out of, out of master's. Like, I will never be able to get a teaching job because I do weird stuff. And I'm not going to be ap apologetic for it. But then, it actually became a very positive thing for me. So, um, ASU reached out um, when I was living in New York. And they were like, we have this job opening. And we want to do something different. And, you know, we, we really like what you do. So, th that was, it was history. So, it really became a positive thing. And I knew I always wanted to teach. I've taught Korean. I know. I taught Korean. And I've my first job, actually, to teach was um, music theory. Um, I was such a nerd in college. I loved being a nerd. And I, I did that. And I knew I wanted to share everything. I want to help people. I, I honestly think, you know, like teaching is exactly what I should be doing as my personality, and I love working with other people. I hate being alone. I'm such a, <laughs> you know. I'm both extroverts. <laughs> yes. So um, let's, I mean, we're gonna, you know, go through some of the, the kind of different contexts of teaching, because like teaching, that's that's a huge word. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go through the list. And yeah, like don't yeah. limit yourself. Look, there are, there are so many more places in context you can teach than are up on this one slide, you know. Um, yeah, let's just go through these quickly. Public school, I taught in public school for six years after I got my master's, I got my teacher certification uh, and helped create a, an arts magnet school. And also I just want to say that teaching supports our project work. Yes. You know, why, why I love project work is it, it has an end. It has a beginning and an end. It's not, you know, you, you do a project and then you can take a break and you do, then you go to another project. So that's like very creative, but your teach, teacher thing is usually pretty consistent, right? Um, so public school, you know, obviously you have to get teacher certified. It depends on the state. If you're in Virginia, you're lucky and unlucky, number one, because it's really hard to get a gig there because it's where everyone wants to be, right? 16 high schools and middle school programs in one county, in Loudoun County, in Virginia. Shout out to Kevin. But you do, and, and a lot of people don't recognize, like my, my uh, University of North Carolina Greensboro, where I got my teaching cert, they didn't recognize me as a guitarist, so I had to do trumpet. I didn't middle, teach middle school band, which made me physically ill. Anyone that does that is like a god or goddess. Uh, private schools don't require the certification. Um, uh, and one-on-one -on -one studio is obvious. Yeah. Um, collegiate community school. Um, actually, if you're a student now, if, as I've been on many search committees, um, it is good to invest in DMA. I know I'm very guilty of saying that because I, didn't, I don't have a DMA. But I built my portfolio. I had a huge body of works, and um, and that would be also very good during your time at DMA. Think about the things that you're really passionate about and really produce like creative projects, albums, or whatever, um, collaborative works, and that would be a really good way to navigate and 
also, depending on where you live, I don't know, Brian's probably not in here, but I was talking to Brian yesterday, who has a great teaching gig in California. Depending on where you live, a lot of community schools are like kind of being coming free. And he was telling me about how now he's teaching at his high school in collaboration with a community college, a community college courses that his high schoolers can get credit for. There are just all kinds of creative ways to work this, right? Like you can do, be an adjunct at two places. You can go, like I'm at Guilford because I found an, a, like a niche in liberal arts, right? So North Carolina, if you think about North Carolina, UNCSA is the conservatory. App State with Adam and ECU with Elliot are kind of the large big schools. I'm the liberal arts, so you can come and double major. You know, I have the double major kind of thing going on in liberal arts. So you, you, have, you know, I just was in a place where people said yes and started with zero majors, nothing. There were, there were, you know, so you just can build these things. Um, what's next? Uh, churches, whether you're religious or not religious, churches have been friends of musicians for a long time and patrons. So uh, sometimes you can find like music academies within churches or go to a church and say, hey, I want to like build a, an academy. I want to start a music academy. Um, all right. Um, music academy, same thing. Great. Online, you guys know Tone Bass. Those are, you know, created by one of my, two of my great friends. And, you know, there, there are many ways that you can also invest in if you're very savvy with tech. And, you know, you can also invest in, you know, how to make a living through online platforms, you know, um, Classical Guitar Corner, right, Tone Base, and Artist Works, and there's so many um, these like online subscription-based um, teaching sites, and um, there are ways that you can do Zoom teaching, so, you know, there are ways that you can invest in these yeah, know, so, teaching. Some of my alums are like killing it online right now, um, teaching. Uh, pedagogical development is just, you know, Suzuki training, Child Bloom. I don't know if Child Bloom is around, but if you connect yourself, if you get Suzuki certified, okay, you've got another resource, right? It's not just you've got it on your resume and you can do it. It's like you're connected to a thing that can help hook you up with resources. Uh, you know, if you come from a specific pedagogy, you know, uh, Berkeley, I was talking to Kim Perlick, they just put all their pedagogy out, or Aaron Shearer, or whoever. If you connect yourself to a pedagogical system, that's just another resource for you. And then quickly navigating being a teacher, be a good person. Yes, oh my gosh. I've always had kind teachers, I mean, except for my first teacher in Korea, but um, that's okay. We'll talk about that on another time. But it's another lecture. I feel like being a teacher, it's more than just teaching skills, right? It's teaching I mean, life, man. And yeah. It's like being a really good mentor. And I, I really think creating a safe environment, warm environment, and not to make meanie yourself, right? Mini, I always say, I'm not trying to take, you know, make meanie versions of myself. I want to help find um, folks' voice. So um, I think being a teacher is just like, just please be nice. There's no need to traumatize kids. No, the best thing you can do is elevate who they are, right? You're just there with them on their journey. And if you can elevate, you can find out what makes them tick and what's, what is their learning process, what are their strengths. All right, we need to keep going. Yeah, we are really good on time. So next slide, entrepreneur hat. Do you see so many hats? I feel like being an entrepreneur, it's like it's like a it's like can of can of things. It's a Pandora box. It's a lot of things. So we wanted to um, ask you, what does being an entrepreneur look like, and what does it mean? Yeah. Okay, nobody. Yeah, it is about, what does it look like to do? Everything. Create, yeah, to create your own scene in business. Right. It's like, you know, you have all these creative ideas. How do you make money? How do you make it work? How do you produce these things? I think that's what it means to be an entrepreneur. So we're going to give you a little role play. Okay, we'll do it. So this is called... I told you, we were before we were going to we're gonna beatbox before we finish. So, okay. So elevated... Um, pitch. It's like, it's so funny. This just happened with an artist. I mean, we were just at a restaurant and she was pitching this concert to me and I was like, yes, I'm interested, but let's do How many elevator speeches have you had at the GFA? I've probably had at least four. Me too. Like a round five. Interactions. Hopefully you guys have two. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're like 13 years old, you can still have your elevator speech. Parents, you need to help. Okay, so I'm a presenter. Let's say I'm a presenter in Indiana. We're in the elevator. We're in the elevator. We're literally in the elevator. We've got like, 
I don't know, eight floors? Yes, right. and it has to be concise. So you have to think about five categories, the what, the who, the where, and the when, and what, what right? So here we Are go. You Gigi? Hi. Oh my gosh, I know I've heard so much about you. Oh, I know who you are. Yeah. Kevin, nice, nice to meet to you. Meet you. Okay, um, what have you been up to? What's your what's going on? You know, I'm starting this new series in Indiana, Jacob School of Music, and you know, I'm trying to book artists, you know, chamber series. I'm trying to, you know, start the series. I want it to be pushing the boundaries, right? Not just classical music, and oh, but oh, I'm, I have to tell you about a project I'm doing right now. Tell me what. Okay, so you, yeah, I, I do the U.S. Guitar Orchestra, but I just did yes, the same kind of one off project with one of Kevin Callahan's pieces, which like really pushes boundaries. There's vocalization and you know sat, found sounds and all kinds of things. And I did I did like nine people. Do you think that would be something you might be interested in having on the series? Cool, can you, do you have a demo recording? Do you have a recording? I do, I can give you YouTube. Oh like, wow, yeah. so it's nine why people? Why don't we like share phone numbers? Okay, great. Okay, awesome. Boom. Done. And then we follow up. You should follow up with these. By the way, I really want to be on that chamber series. Okay, yes, but this is happening. This is happening. <laughs> so I know this is kind of a really quick thing, um, but it was concise. And I want to just be, you know, getting your ideas of like how to be really precise with your words. What is it that you want to do? And when do you want to do it? And what what you, what what is it that you want to do? So I'm we're gonna. This should be rhetorical based on time. Okay. So okay. Fine. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Because we were going to have you guys create the elevator speech and actually share, but time-wise, I mean, we're down to we six minutes. minutes. Uh, we were six trying to be as minutes. fast as possible. We went but through everything. If y'all want to do elevators, um, pitch to us. Pitch to us. If you see us in the hallway, and we'll, stop we're us. more than happy to give you some feedback and things like that. Okay. Yep. So. Let's uh, figure out. Um, so just knowing yourself and what you're good at. So I've taken an aptitude test. Um, it's like a corporate aptitude test of your work style. Um, I did this like at a conference a long time ago, and it was really helpful for me because I always thought I knew myself, but I obviously didn't. And and I got this I got this test back, and I was like, I'm a trailblazer. I'm really like creative. I love like you know the fun things, but my biggest weakness is I'm really bad with logistics. I am very lazy when it comes to the not fun parts. Like, you know, it's like, how do you do it? So I really work well with um, someone hounding at me. It's like, Gigi, where's your thing? Here's your deadline. You gotta do this. So I always have to be hounded at by somebody else. And that's the best um, work scenario. I like the fun things, but I'm really bad at details. What is you? Yeah, I, I'm a big picture person. Also, I'm really good with logistics, but I really hate like the details. Of the, like, I don't like to do the spreadsheet. Oh, please do the spreadsheet for me. Uh, so yeah, de I'm a kind. Of, we're a little bit alike in that I'd rather someone else do the little teeny details. But you have to know wh what your strength is. If you are great at the details, pair with someone who's big picture, right? easy um great we want to talk a little bit about normalizing day jobs yeah do you want to say that or you want me to yes I, yeah okay i there's no shame in day jobs none i mean meaning other outside of music right so my generation was taught to live to work that was what my generation that's what i was taught to do the millen my millennial students, and yes, I'm that old, and I have a lot of millennial students, taught me about uh, working to live. All right, so younger generation knows right now the way you make the money is STEM, right? I mean, medical, science, or computers. We all know that that's where money is, you know, some business too, right? So, so you have to know, like, you have to know how much money you need to get by, what you need to do, you know, there are all kinds of ways that you can, you can do music therapy, you can do ethnomusicology, you can do musicology, although those fields, some of those fields are getting more saturated. You can, you can, you know, I have a guy right now who's a triple major. He wants to be a neurosurgeon, he's a chemist, ma chemistry major, health science, and music. So don't shut the door on 
you know, day jobs or jobs other than. You can, you can choose to live to work or work to live. You have to kind of know your own needs. Great. Um, I'm just going to do quickly, um, as an entrepreneur, I feel like you have to do some basic production skills. Those are really good investment um, to make during your time in college or now. YouTube is great. Um, just really try to get yourself um, really savvy with a DAW or, you know, video editing skills. Those are, um, just don't practice all the time. It's just do 30 minutes of day and try to do these editing skills. I mean, it is really, really relevant to what we do. Uh, quickly, being a communicator, a lot of artists are introverts. And this is what you gotta do. You gotta fake it till you make it if you're an introvert. You've got to pretend like you're on stage and you're an actor and you have to figure out how to just, you know, go and talk to people. Email, we hate email. I've never met anyone who likes email, but it's important, right? Just reach out in whatever way you can and communicate and don't be afraid to talk to everybody. The guitar world rocks. Look at the people who are here. Everyone is so nice and we need each other. So don't be afraid to be a good communicator and to do it a lot. Nonprofit work. I'm on five nonprofits right now because I just quit one. Nonprofits are good to attach yourself to because they're great resources. They have grants, they have people who know things. Being on a board of directors doesn't cost you any money. It's just a, a connection resource thing. So I would strongly encourage any kind of board work that you can do in getting involved in like any kind of arts nonprofit work, which isn't hard. You can do that even as a young person. Great, finding and creating gigs. Um, please don't wait. In, um, for somebody to open the door, knock on the door for, for opportunities. You can make, literally create your own gig opportunities if you want to keep playing. So I have no idea how many hospitals, schools, and other programs that I've emailed just so I can play. Okay, those are, don't be scared. The worst thing that could ever happen is that they never get back to you or they say no. So you can always knock on other people's doors and I'm really trying to move on fast. Fractured Atlas, so I wanted to talk about, so let's say you want, you need to have like $5,000 for this project to happen, but you know two really cool people who are super rich and they want to donate. So for, for tax deductions, um, deduction possibility, you can go and go to Fractured Atlas um, fracturedatlas.com, um, dot org, and what you can do, you they take a percentage of of the money that they're trying to, um, that you're trying to receive, but they can have that as tax deductible. So does that does that make sense, right? So if you have really rich friends and you want to make this project happen, so they're not just giving you money. So if they want that option of tax deduction, so fractured atlas, or you can go through the nonprofit organization and ask them if you can. Um, kind of do a money laundering situation. And, um, which is kind of funny. Whatever. Um, so, and... Um, we are laundering money as, uh, as we speak. So, large crowdfunding. I've seen so many great successes. You can, um, if you're trying to raise money and have a lot of friends, good for you. Um, pay, uh, Kickstarter, GoFundMe, all those great, and then you have this like kind of subscription based thing called Patreon, and yeah. Artists have fundraised there through all of history. I mean, I have I've put a um, hold on USGO for 2024 because I'm going to spend a year fundraising. It takes a lot, but don't be afraid to ask for money. Don't be afraid to look for money. Go get a go to a restaurant in your hometown and get a Friday or Saturday night gig. You know. It's all accessible. Just don't box yourself in to a specific thing that you think you have to do in order to be a musician. And by the way, she and I are now all of your resources. Yes. Just email us, tell us your idea, and we can maybe hook you up with someone we know, and a lot of people in the room and at the GFA would do the same. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. No, okay, we're going to end the slide with this. What are your hats? I'm sorry, it's obnoxious, but this is how you should feel, okay? And so overwhelmed, so many things. What is happening? Start screaming, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You guys have been wonderful. If you guys have Q&A, we'll be in the hallway for like 15 minutes if you want to elevate your speeches or talk to us. Thanks so much for coming, you guys. Thank you.